Hello, everyone, and welcome to StoryForge, an offshoot of the Untold Stories project. This project signs a light on role-playing systems that don't get the attention they deserve. StoryForge, specifically, is meant to focus on character creation within these systems. My name is Andy, and I will be your Forge Master for this series, so let's strike while the iron is hot. Are you looking for a game that lets you play as a character excited to test out what the world has to offer? Or maybe you're looking for a game that lets you be a little bit more jaded, a bit older, maybe a bit wiser, if we can say that you're any wiser when you're just a little bit older, and you want to deal with some of the harsher realities around you, a game where the grown-ups can't help you, and it's all up to you and your friends to save the day? If this is the game you're looking for, welcome to Free League Publishing's world of Tales from the Loop and Things from the Flood. So... Tales from the Loop lets you play as a kid back in the 1980s when bikes ruled the summer streets and you and your friends could stay out until your mom called you home. When the mysteries around you were there to be solved by you and your friends, all without a care in the world. Things from the Flood is a little bit different. It lets you play as a teenager in the 1990s where the world was changing so fast the older generations couldn't keep up and the world felt a little bit smaller as it got more connected where the mysteries around you still needed to be solved so you could understand your place in the world. Both of these games use the same engine for their mechanics, so we're going to talk about both of them today in our episode and try to highlight some of the differences between the two as we do so. Both of these games are based on the worlds of Simon Stallenhag, a Swedish artist, musician, and designer with a focus on the retro-futuristic. The games combine elements of his art, depicting a world where technology flourished on a different path from the one we know, which all led up to the setting of Tales from the Loop. But then that technology began to falter and fail, which led to the things from the flood. In each of these games, you get to play as one of the protagonists, someone between the ages of 10 and 19, investigating, the investigating these two distinct realms of time. Everything from the strange and wonderful to the horrific and violent can be played out. And if this sounds a little familiar to you, you might be familiar with the Amazon uh, title, Tales from the Loop, which that series is based off of the same artist's work. Tales from the Loop was the first of these two systems to come out and is the basis for everything we're going to see in Things from the Flood as it's its own standalone sequel. A lot of the game mechanics are the same between these two systems, but there are a few differences. I'm going to highlight the similarities first, just so we can kind of get a common ground. So each of the games uses a, D, uses a set of D6s to accomplish your tasks. You're usually looking for a single success, but the way to get that single success is to roll a six on any one of your D6s. You're going to combine your attribute score with the skill that you're using, along with any bonuses that you can get, and then you're going to give those dice a throw looking for that six. Connections between the player characters are vitally important. Usually this means that when you're playing the game, you're going to be a group of friends who already know each other, but you could be akin to a group similar to the Breakfast Club brought together by a common, you know, common school tie or something else that's happened to you that you're going to share. Another thing that's similar with this, the adults can't help you. In both of these games, it is up to the players to solve the mystery that arises. The adults are either way too busy or way too out of touch to help. So it's up to the player characters to work it out themselves. Some of the differences between the two systems. Tales from the Loop has the characters being aged 10 to 14. Things from the Flood has characters aged 15 to 19. So you're thinking really young to beginnings of their teenagers to teenagers up until almost young adulthood. Those young kids in Tales from the Loop have a thing called pride. The teenagers from Things from the Flood have a thing called shame. Both of these have the same mechanic, but they're usually a little bit differently. So something that is a pride is something that the kids are very proud of, something that gives them power and it makes them feel invincible. For the teenagers, that shame is something that they don't like to admit something that makes them feel very apart from everybody else that they're around. Each of these games has a, uh, a type for the player characters. So the games are usually centered around a type of kid 
what that kid is really good at. So there's a little bit of overlap between the two systems, but Tales from the Loop has eight different types of kids that are available, and Things from the Flood has 10 different types of kids that are available. Luck points are a mechanic that only exists in Tales from the Loop, basically meaning that those uh, younger kids have the ability to be super lucky, uh, give themselves free rerolls, things of that nature, so that they can survive these harrowing trials of these mysteries that they're trying to um, pursue. You do not get this option in Things from the Flood. It's a little bit deadlier because of that. And that leads me to my last point, which is the deadliness of the games. In the Tales games, your character is not in danger of dying. You may take consequences that may leave your character a little bit broken and needing to go find an adult to maybe help console you, but you're never in danger of actually dying from any of these uh, effects that you run into. And if think about the 80s movies that featured a lot of kid protagonists like Goonies, none of those kids were actually ever in danger of failing to succeed. They were never in danger of dying uh, due to the stuff that they ran into. But in Things from the Flood, the threat of death is very, very real, and the players need to play accordingly. So, are you ready to make a character for either one of these games? Great! Let's get into a brief rundown of what it takes to make a character in either Tales from the Loop or Things from the Flood, and then we're going to show you what one looks like. So, first things first, you need to know what type of kid you're playing. I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but in each game, there's a little bit of a difference. There's a little bit of an overlap. If you're looking to play Tales from the Loop, you have the option of eight different types, a bookworm, a computer geek, a hick, a jock, a popular kid, a rocker, a troublemaker, or a weirdo. For things from the flood, you have a hacker, a jock, a lone wolf, a motorhead, a party animal, a raver, a rocker, seeker, snob, or street kid. Each type of kid has three skills that are considered key. Next, we're gonna define the character's attributes. There are four different attributes in the game. Body, tech, heart, and mind. You're gonna get 14 points to spend on these four. Nothing can be less than one, and nothing can be higher than five. Next up are your skills, with each attribute being connected to three of those skills. Body has sneak, force, and move. Tech has tinker, program, and calculate. Heart has contact, charm, and lead. Mind has investigate, comprehend, and empathize. You're going to get 10 points to spend on these 12 skills. And based on the type of kid you are, the three key skills can go up to three. Every other skill can only go to one. Next up, the kids are going to have an iconic item, something that defines who they are. Maybe it's a prized copy of Lord of the Rings. Maybe it's a pager. Maybe it's the baseball bat that you use to hit the game-winning home run. Whatever it is, this item is something that's going to help you out. It says something about who you are. Whenever you are able to use this item in game one time per game session, you're going to get a plus two dice bonus when you use it. Every kid is going to have a problem, something that worries them about everyday life. It helps to choose a problem that you want to explore in game. Maybe something like, hey, mom and dad are going through a divorce or you're getting bullied in school. Something that has an effect on these kids, something that's going to kind of drive them forward, something that the GM can use, not against you, but to help drive your own personal story within the game. Along with this problem, all of the kids are going to have a drive. The drive is the reason that you're going to put yourself in harm's way, the reason that you're going to go out and solve these mysteries happening in the world around you. From the typical, oh, it's the right thing to do, to the more bleak, well, no one else is going to save us. 
anything within those two extremes is really going to work for your personal drive. Next up, you're going to want to define how you know the other players you're playing with. Maybe you have an unrequited crush on the most popular kid in school. Are you cousins with the town weirdo? Maybe your step sibling is the town motorhead. Defining how everyone kind of knows each other can help explain why you guys keep coming back together to solve these mysteries. Finally, each character is going to choose an anchor, someone you can go to for support, comfort, and care. Now, it can't be their own parent, because as I said earlier, the parents are way too out of touch to really be of any help. And it cannot be another member of the party, it cannot be another member of the teen or young child group. Uh, basically, what this means is in, the, in terms of the game, if you suffer any sort of condition while playing the game, you can go to this person, have a non-trouble scene, and agree to be taken care of, and that, conditions, that condition or conditions can be removed so you can continue without threat of taking any more penalties. So we've talked about how to make a character. Now I'm going to show you one. What you see on the screen is a character that I've made for my things for the, from the Flood game that I will be running at Origins this year. This is the first time I've made a game with things from the Flood, so you know, bear with me. This, it's a relatively easy simple system to make a character for. In the game I play tested it has been a lot of uh, fun. It's been a lot of receiving a lot of good reviews from the players that have played in it. So we have in front of us Maggie Mags Walters who is a motorhead. Uh, you can see we've got her age. She's 17 at the point in time of our game, which is taking place in August of 1997. You have a favorite song. I tried to pick, for all the characters in this game, I tried to pick songs that came out in either 96 or 97. You can see her drive is to figure out what makes it tick, which kind of goes along with her being a motorhead. Uh, her anchor is Larry Ells, who's a local handyman. Yes, the adults are not, with it but they the they are still the anchors for the characters they just aren't allowed to really help you solve the mystery like i said you guys are supposed to be the ones going out and doing the things necessary to figure out what's happening um her problem some experiments have got some experiments have gotten me in trouble with the local authorities so she's tried to make different mechanisms or different uh tinker different tech items that have just kind of run amok throughout her town. Local authorities haven't been too happy with her. Now, shame is, I think we kind of touched on this a little bit uh, for the teenagers. This is the younger version of pride. So this is something that they definitely don't necessarily want to share, but it's possible it's, it could be known. Her shame is her dad is abusive when he drinks. So that's just something to, Kind of play into on the left hand side of the screen we can see that we've got our attributes we have a three in body a five in tech a three in heart and a three in mind so that ends up being our 14 points maggie's skills nothing in sneak one in force one in move three in tinker one in program two in calculate one in lead two in investigate and one in comprehend. And if you're doing the math at home, yes, that's going to come out to be 12. The reason it's 12 instead of 10 is because I have given these characters a little bit of a level increase for my game. So math wasn't working out when I was doing some playtesting of the numbers, so I had to increase skills. So normally characters are supposed to only have 10 points in skills. All of the characters I made for this game have 12 just because of that. Relationship section here, this is how you're related to the other teens. Uh, I've got this on a, another sheet of paper that I will hand out to my player character, to my players when the convention rolls around. It's just easier because there's not a whole lot of room on these sheets for that. Down here, we've got their iconic items. So Maggie's iconic item is a Swiss army knife. I kind of left this vague to let the character's player explain why this is an iconic iconic item. Maybe it's her grandfather's, um, maybe it belonged to another sibling who's moved on to college, that kind of thing. 
down here, we have our conditions. So I talked about uh, suffering conditions. You suffer conditions when you fail during a trouble scene, or if you attempt to push your role. Pushing your role means I failed initially and I want to, I want to succeed. So if I push my role, I accept a condition, upset, scared, exhausted, usually not broken and scarred or injured because those are a little bit more uh, damaging to the player overall. And you get to automatically re-roll your dice to see if you can get that six. Uh, scars are physical representations of damage that the characters may take depending on what happens during the game. Uh, if you take enough of them and you accept them, your character could die. But yeah, this is it. This is Maggie. This is a character from Things from the Flood. So not too bad, right guys? Everyone, thank you very much for joining me for another one of our character creation sessions. As you know, here at USP, we do play live games over on our Twitch channel. So if you're interested in any of our live plays, you can come check us out there. We've got our link down below. Also, if you're at all interested in Iron Kingdoms as a game system that you might want to pick up, we have a drive through RPG affiliate link that you can click to follow through to purchase that PDF. Everything that you do, if you follow that link, will give us a little bit of a kickback so that we can continue to provide you guys really good content, both on our Twitch channel and here on YouTube with stuff like StoryForge. So if you liked what you saw, please go ahead and hit that like button and click the bell to get notified when we put up new videos like this. And if you're interested, leave us a comment below and what you might want to see in the future. Thank you for watching.